Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, whatever time it, 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 it may be in your part of the world. Um, we are in Cardiff and uh, we're very pleased to be launching our new report today, Communicating Flood Risks and Changing Climate, Nine Principles Promoting Public Engagement. Um, Stuart is going to introduce the report and a little bit of background to it. Um, my name's Adam Corner and I'm the, the research director at Climate Outreach and, and as Stuart will say a little bit more about in a second, this, is a, uh, this report is a collaboration between uh, the Understanding Risk Group um, in the School of Psychology at Cardiff University and Climate Outreach. And Stuart will do a bit of background then I'm going to come back in and cover the, the, the main nine principles that we talk about in the report, um, trying to summarise the, the, the main points. Um, in around about half an hour and then we should have plenty of time at the end for taking questions um, and um, both Stuart and I will be able to take questions at the end. So just to say on the practical side of things, um, if you can't hear us for some reason um, and you're just looking at us waving around, then click on call using computer and that should hopefully improve things. Please do uh, write down questions and queries and comments um, on, on using the comment function of WebEx as we're giving the presentation. Um, if you, you can address them to everyone, that's absolutely fine. Um, or perhaps um, easier is to address them to uh, my colleague Leanne Delay, um, who you should be able to see as a participant in, the, in, in, the, in this webinar. And Leanne's going to collate the questions um, and, and pass them on to us as they're, as they're coming in so that we can um, address them as, as seamlessly as possible at the end, we hope. So I'll pass on to Stuart now and I'll be back uh, shortly to talk through the, the main body of the report. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. I'm Stuart Capstick uh, at Cardiff University. I'm a research fellow here in the School of Psychology interested in public understanding of and responses to climate change in various guises. What I'm going to talk about now, um, just for a few minutes, is some of the background to uh, this report. Um, the, the, so this is the, re the main report that um, Adam's going to be talking about, but I, I just want to uh, talk about some of the, the kind of groundwork to this and the research interest in the links between um, extreme weather and the psychology of climate change. So for the next few slides, I will step back a little bit from the main um, uh, purpose of this webinar, but just to talk a, a bit about the background. Okay, so um, uh, my research looks at how people understand and respond to climate change. And one of the things that uh, I and other researchers have been interested in for uh, quite a while now is the possible connections between people's day-to-day uh, -day experiences with the weather and with weather events uh, and their attitudes towards climate change. Now, we know, of course, that uh, climate change itself is likely to lead to more and worse uh, extreme weather. The science tells us this. Uh, we know as well that climate change has contributed to changes in the weather that we've seen so far. Now, from the point of view of people's understanding of climate change, so their climate change psychology, their attitudes towards it, um, encounters with the weather are also uh, important because these are one of the few ways in which the rather abstract and, and complex idea of climate change can come to seem more real and more concrete and more relevant to people's lives. And because of this, there's been um, an increasing amount of research looking at whether people's experiences with the weather influence their views about climate change. So for example, one uh, study that illustrates this quite well uh, from the USA shows that even if you just get people to think about words and concepts to do with heat, uh, and heat-related weather, then their belief in climate change increases. And there's been quite a few studies as well that show that uh, opinion poll indicators of belief in climate change, concern about climate change, um, do vary and rise and fall in line with temperature, particularly when this is outside of uh, the usual temperature range for a location. Now, although these studies um, shed some light on the role of the weather and temperature as an influence on attitudes, there hasn't actually been, strangely, that much research looking at the role of extreme uh, weather events like flooding. Um, and this is important because, of course, um, although temperatures will rise on average in aggregate um, globally, extreme weather events like storms, droughts, heat waves and flooding um, are a particular concern uh, for many people and have the potential to cause a lot of upheaval, uh, loss of life, loss of property and so on. 
Now, focusing in on the, on the UK, for anyone who was in the UK uh, in the winter of 2013, the first months of 2014, uh, you'll remember that the, the storms and, and flooding that we uh, experienced, even if you weren't in the UK, you might have heard about this. So even for a, a country which has um, notoriously unlovely weather, this went on for, for a long time, went on for several months and caused misery for uh, a lot of people. I mean, it also became um, a, a major national issue that was covered extensively in the news uh, and which led to the leaders of all the main political parties. Yeah, Webex has invited me to having a flooding day. How are you doing? Mm. Technical, technical problems. Um, okay, so yeah. th this was a major national issue um, and was a focus of a lot of attention by the media and politicians. Now, when this was, was happening at the time, uh, it occurred to us at the time yep. that this could actually be an important opportunity to try to look carefully uh, how people's experiences right. connect with their perceptions of climate change. And we were able to get some uh, funding from the ESRC, so one of the main um, funding councils that fund social science research, uh, to carry out a, a large national survey of attitudes to climate change, which we ran um, very soon after this flooding happened. And the main purpose of this was to look at whether and how the flooding might have uh, affected people's attitudes. So in a nutshell, uh, we carried out interviews with 2,000 people across Great Britain. Half of these were done in five heavily affected parts of the country, uh, in Wales, the north of England, south of England, uh, and the rest were with a, a nationally representative sample. And from this research, we, we found that people who were affected um, by the flooding were more concerned about climate change, were more willing to act on it, uh, and as, uh, were also more supportive of uh, national policy to tackle climate change. So, for example, twice as many of those people who were affected by uh, the flooding in the flood-affected areas um, were, um, saw climate change as one as being one of the, the top three national issues facing uh, the UK over the next 20 years. And also we found that uh, across the representative national sample, so even people who weren't directly affected by the flooding, uh, a majority of, of almost two thirds um, were of the view that the flooding uh, was connected to climate change. So that's kind of that, that's just to give a, a brief background on, on the social science that we were doing and which um, as part and parcel of that, we, the plan was to do this research, but then also to think uh, subsequently about how we might apply this research and, and what use is, is knowing this sort of information. How can you apply this in a practical context? So we wanted to do this, this as social scientists. We're getting ready to submit this for publication, but we wanted to know what practical lessons uh, can be learned about uh, communicating climate change and flood, flood risks. So um, that's where Climate Outreach, or COIN as they were then, uh, agreed to uh, help us out um, by organising a one-day workshop for researchers and practitioners, looking at the implications not just for our research study, but also other similar pieces of work, because there was quite a number of um, research studies at the time looking at people's experiences with flooding uh, in different ways. Um, and if you, when you look in uh, the report that I think has been forwarded to you, you can find um, various links and further reading to some of those other research projects, as well as the one that Cardiff led on. Um, so, so what happened was we, uh, or rather Climate Outreach, organized a workshop back in June in Oxford. And we were fortunate to have uh, climate scientists as well as uh, social scientists along together with various people with personal experience of flooding and others involved in uh, planning and emergency responses. And climate outreach, um, so Adam and Lydia uh, ran a series of discussions which were designed to uh, generate some ideas about the best ways of communicating uh, flood risks uh, in a changing climate or alternatively the best way to communicate about climate change in the context of extreme weather. And so arising from uh, that workshop, the following report that Adam's going to talk to you through in more detail has been produced. And it's important to stress that this, this um, isn't a literature review. It's not um, what Adam and I um, thought think from, from a review of the literature are the best ways to communicate climate change. This, this is a particular approach we've taken, which is to synthesize the recommendations and the advice and, and, and the thoughts that came out of the day with those who were present. Uh, and this report has been uh, formally endorsed by 27 of those people who came along on the day. And those people are, are listed at the start of the report. 
So what I'll do now is um, hand over to Adam, who will take you through the nine principles that were derived from this. Okay, thank you very much, Stuart. And yeah, that's um, exactly as Stuart says. That, that that's that's really the the the, the key kind of background and events that, that led up to this um, report being produced. And I think it's just worth emphasising again that it was a really fantastic group of people that we had in the room that day from physical scientists, social scientists, people from who study humanities and public engagement with climate change and, and, and flood and, and other types of risks, um, policy makers, practitioners, NGOs. So a really diverse group of people. Um, and because of that, I think we've, 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 we've come up with some interesting uh, uh, recommendations in the report. So I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to go through from, from, from start to finish. Um, and there's, there's there's nine principles that we that we detail in this report, and and, and I would encourage you to, to take a look at the report if you if you haven't had a look at it already um, for for more detail, and and just to emphasise that I guess we're really acting as uh, spokespeople for this for this for this diverse group that we assembled um, in Oxford back in June, and uh, so we will we'll try our best to, to do justice to the to the content of it, um, and, and and look forward to taking some questions and answers at the end as well. So the first principle in the report, and, and, and there is a reason that we, that we put this one first, I think, as well. Um, it, it stands out a little bit from, from, from the, the, the other eight that we included, um, is that climate scientists can quantify the role of human influence in individual flooding events, specifically whether they are made more or less likely in a change in climate. Now, we, we, we put it first because I think it's quite a bold statement. It's perhaps something that you wouldn't um, expect to read um, because I think, or I certainly can say from, from my perspective, and I think many people have grown used to the idea of hearing statements such as, well, the relationship between weather and climate change is incredibly complex and no single weather event can ever be simplistically causally attributed to climate change. And those things are true, but the question is whether we can say something a bit more positive, a bit more constructive, whether we can follow uh, good principles of communicating about uncertainty and start with, with what we know um, before emphasising what we don't know. And, and the, the science of, of what's known as probabilistic event attribution, or uh, attribution for short, um, is, is rapidly developing. And, and one of the, the, the strongest statements I think we heard during the, the Oxford workshop in June um, was that increasingly it is possible um, and um, within a relatively short period of time, so, so months certainly rather than years later, for scientists to estimate the, the, the role of human-caused climate change in an extreme weather event and whether climate change made it more or less likely to occur. So that in and of itself isn't, isn't enough to, to, to build wider public engagement on climate change. It's the first step, but it feels like a really robust platform and a, a platform on which we can, we, can, we can put the other eight principles that we have in this report and layer them on top of it. It means that instead of wondering whether there's a link between weather and climate change, we can say something about how strong that link is and, and what the relationship between climate change and future um, weather events will be in the future. There's a little bit of feedback, so someone might have their, their, their speakers on now, perhaps. So the principle number two, and this, this I guess, is, has some kind of uh, an analogy to the, to, to, to the first point in that the first, the first principle is all about climate scientists making a link between weather and climate change. Our second principle is about whether people, ordinary people, non-scientists make uh, a link between particular weather events and climate change, and in particular flooding. Now, obviously, this is this was the genesis of the report. This is this was the motivation for for carrying it out in the first place. Um, as Stuart said, the, the the team at Cardiff University carried out uh, a, a nationally representative sample of the UK population, as well as sm a smaller subset of people um, who had directly experienced flooding. Um, and and what they found was that. Uh, th there is evidence that people are joining the dots on flooding and climate change. So in some senses, although it's not a particularly nice phrase to use, there is, a, 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 I guess, a, a kind of window of opportunity for, for wider engagement um, around climate change when uh, a, an extreme weather event such as flooding um, occurs. And it, uh, it, uh, Stuart might say more about this um, in, in the Q&A at the end, but 
it, it hasn't always been this way. Um, certainly earlier research um, in the UK and in other countries wasn't able to, to, to point to such a, um, a direct link and partly that's because of the methods that we used but perhaps partly that's because the, 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 the psychological link in people's minds between um, potential climate impacts and climate change really is growing. Um, now, that all being said, uh, as with any other piece of, of evidence on, on climate change, there's the potential for um, polarisation. So a long-standing um, finding I'm sure many of you will be familiar with is that um, scepticism about climate change tends to be higher on, on the right of politics. It tends to be higher amongst people who, who endorse um, free market economics, for example. Um, and so we, we might expect, and there is some evidence to show, that when people experience extreme weather, even directly experience the type of extreme weather that is predicted as an impact of climate change, they may not link it to climate change, but perhaps because of that underlying scepticism. Um, so it, it matters the, the, the communication techniques that are around, I guess, is the, is the take on there. Now, the, the, the Cardiff survey uh, was you know, a significant piece of research. It, it, it happened relatively quickly after the 2013 floods, um, but it still happened after them and, and, a, and a little while after them. Um, and, and ideally, one of the, one of the key points that we, that we took from, from the Oxford workshop was that the best time to be able to do public engagement is actually not, not during um, what is a potentially traumatic event for people, um, or even necessarily after, but to try and talk to people about climate change and the relationship between flooding, other climate impacts, and, and the wider piece on climate change um, as, as a part of general day-to-day -day life. Um, we, there's a quote that we use from, from the MP, um, Adam Afriye, never quite sure how to say his name, um, which I think makes the point quite well. Um, he's, 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 he's interviewed by Channel 4 News, he's standing knee deep in water, um, in, in, in flood water, and he says this is not the day to talk about climate change. Now he wasn't dismissing the risks or the reality of climate change, and actually that was a sentiment that was shared quite widely um, among participants in the Oxford workshop, um, but it's simply that when something traumatic like a flood is taking place, um, perhaps storming in and, and, and making a link about climate change if people haven't already been primed to, to think in that way isn't, isn't the best thing to do. So it's, it's crucial to sort of overcome that, that wider problem of social silence around climate change to just normalise the idea that there are links between floods and climate change. And, and I guess to, to summarise, to be, to be proactive and to try and tailor communications to the audience as much as possible to a particular community or whether it's to the general public, um, through developing a dialogue. And that's something that doesn't need to wait until a disaster to strike to happen. It should be something that happens um, as a part of our collective commitment to building public engagement with climate change. Now, the fourth principle that, that, that we've included here, I think it's, it's fair to say, and, and again, maybe this is something we can come back to in the Q&A, there's a, there's a split really in these, in these principles between things that are more generic and that I think would apply in general to good public engagement, good community engagement, and I would say that this is probably one of them, um, carrying out public engagement sensitively or there's a risk that, that, that it can backfire, and, and principles that are obviously much more specifically tied to, to flooding and, and, and climate change in particular. Um, I think that, you know, it's, in a way it's a simple point here, but it's an important one. It's, it can be a traumatic experience for people to experience uh, uh, flooding. Um, people are going to have, their emotions are going to be running high. It's important to be sensitive to those emotions. For better or for worse, uh, some of the people who might be on the front line of talking to people about flood risks or about public engagement perhaps don't necessarily have um, the best reputation for various different reasons. They might be seen as being preachy or saying, I told you so. No one wants to be messaged at as part of some campaign um, as, as part of a, a response to a sensitive situation. So this links back to the previous point about getting the timing right, for sure. Um, but it also means getting the delivery right, and, and, and that can mean a variety of different things. It, it might mean um, being conscious of the different communication channels that, that are appropriate at different times. So a web resource might be useful at one point, but during uh, a, a, a flooding event, lo local radio might be a really reliable resource. Um, 
the key thing is is to is I guess to not put people under more pressure than they already are during a time that that that, that can be traumatic for them. Uh, the, the, the fifth principle in the report is to do with stepping back and thinking about how people engage with well, with information generally, but, 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 but with climate change in particular. Um, so the fifth principle is that statistical information and accurate scientific data are crucial. Um, and obviously we, we, we need to have them as part of the mix of any communications package. But that trusted peer messengers and personal stories are vital for achieving public engagement. It, most people, if, if we're not scientifically trained, if you're not scientifically trained, are not familiar or confident with, with graphs and statistics. Um, most people might be aware that, that climate change is a, is a scientific reality, but for most people it isn't yet a, a social reality. And lots of the language around climate change, even really commonplace terms, I think, uh, it's good to, to, to remind ourselves as people who probably use these things um, without maybe reflecting whether people understand them or not, things like mitigation, adaptation, they're technical terms. There isn't really an, an everyday uh, a replacement or analogy for those terms that is used widely in climate change discourse. And so things like this, the very building blocks of talking about climate change, can, 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 can perhaps seem technical um, and, and off-putting. And, and in fact, the people that are maybe likely to have more influence and, and be able to have more sway doesn't mean that they, they're the only people that are relevant, but they're perhaps the best people to start the conversation are people's peers, trusted peers um, or, or figures who exist in every community but are going to vary. So there's not going to be one type of person or one organization or one institution that is the same across the whole country or in different communities but there will be trusted people and there will be trusted organizations and so with a bit of um, homework with a bit of stepping back and trying to understand where people are coming from by as we said in an earlier principle having that conversation about the relationship between weather and climate change as part of a general commitment to public engagement um, it should be possible to understand and identify who those people are um, one of the examples we, we use in the report is to say that, for example, an image of, a, of an upturned fridge in someone's front room, something very visceral um, and, and easy to connect with, is probably going to be um, an, a better way of, 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 of getting people's attention, perhaps talking to communities who haven't yet be effect, been affected by flood risks, risks, but maybe in the future, than talking about the, the depth of the water or the, the, the speed of the flood water. Um, which is not to say that scientific information isn't crucial, but it's just not where most people start from. So the sixth principle um, that we that we talk about in the in the report is that flooding and climate impacts can't be separated from the wider social context that determines communities' ability to cope with stress and trauma. So again, this is this is perhaps something that is more of a general point, but it's a general point that very much applies to, uh, to to flood risks. They don't happen in a vacuum. Not everyone is, is affected in the same way by floods or any other type of external shock or trauma. I guess the, the ultimate example of this and the one that always comes to mind for me is, is that uh, in, in New Orleans when they had such serious flooding after Hurricane Katrina, th there was such a clear and definite difference between people who had um, the resources and the agency um, and, and the financial uh, capability to be able to remove themselves from the situation and people who are quite literally trapped um, for the opposite reason. So it just means it just means paying attention um, when we're thinking about uh, who will be who, who's the most important people to engage in a community, whether there are underlying systematic issues like uh, large numbers of people with poor health or people who are at risk for other reasons, um, you know, widespread poverty or a lack of agency, which can mean something as straightforward as perhaps you know a, a quite a, a high turnover of people in a particular area um, or a lot of rented properties or people can't take you know maybe quite simple steps that they might want to take to make themselves more resilient um, so it's the point I guess is of course material infrastructure is important but but building and maintaining a resilient social infrastructure is also crucial as well and I think this is this is very much the starting point for a, a, a tool developed by Joseph Round, Roundtree Foundation, um, which is called Climate Just, where they they map the uh, people's flood risk from and, and risks from climate change uh, onto other indicators of um, social well-being and try to indicate indicate and, and identify where those 
where those problems overlap and obviously that gives you a steer as to where priority areas might be for, for building uh, social resilience to climate impacts. So the seventh principle in uh, our report focuses on the, the, the question of um, learning from but also respecting the, the rights of communities who have been affected multiple times by serious flooding. If you're flooded once, it can be straightforward enough perhaps to dismiss that as uh, uh, some kind of freak occurrence that will never happen again. And of course, my, many people, perhaps most of us, will have strong reasons to hope that, that these things won't become more frequent and they won't become more severe. Um, but if you are affected by flooding twice, three times, it becomes much more difficult to dismiss and to ignore. And people who have been through these extremely difficult processes um, certainly don't want to be in a petri dish and to be studied in that way, but there, there is crucial learning to be to be taken from people who 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 have who have survived and have learned and perhaps have lessons for other people, other communities who might go through the same problems. Um, and and their testimony, because they may well be an example of trusted peers or trusted voices in a way that outside agencies perhaps won't be. Their testimony can be powerful and it can be authoritative and it and it can be informative. But there's a balance to be struck between learning from these communities um, and, and, and being wary of, of an extractive relationship um, about an issue that, that people have do have a right to, to, to forget about if they want to. And this was something that did come up um, several times in, in the Oxford workshop in June, this concept of, of, of communities having a right to forget and not being defined um, by a single issue. So I guess the, the, the take home on this really is just to strike the appropriate balance um, rather than to say we, we shouldn't learn from communities that have been affected um, or to say that they, they, they can be studied as much as, as researchers wish to. The eighth principle in the report is about an issue which has become really quite central, I think, um, to the, the, the psychological research on, on public engagement with climate change. I think anyone who spent any time thinking about how to communicate climate change quickly comes to the realisation that, as Stuart said at the very beginning, there's this sense among most people that climate change is far away in, 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 in time and space. The impacts will happen to someone else um, and, and they won't happen now. So there's a real need to overcome what's now often referred to in a bit of a catch-all term perhaps as, as the psychological distance of climate change. And as Stuart said at the beginning, extreme weather, flood events that are consistent with and that have been made more likely by um, human-caused climate change, these things have the potential at least to reduce that perception that climate change is something that happens to other people. Um, but there's also a risk, and again, this, this is a, the point really here is balance, I think, which came out of the Oxford workshop. There's also a risk of um, over-localising or hyper-localising climate change. Um, there's a risk, I guess, to put it crudely, that you can go from, people could go from thinking this is something that happens to other people to thinking this is something that's only about me. And that's obviously a problem for a variety of reasons. Not, not everyone, thankfully, most people in a country like the UK are going to be encountering climate change or climate impacts on a on a regular routine basis. Um, so that means that, you know, perhaps perhaps some people will say, well, this isn't going to affect me locally, so so I don't need to worry about it. But obviously, there's a much wider set of issues that, that together make up the problem of climate change. And what we we wouldn't want to do with a with a with an engagement process is to is to make people think that that, that wider bigger picture um, doesn't matter. There is, there is some emerging research recently which has suggested that people who, who instinctively see climate change as more of a global um, issue about injustice and have more of an altruistic outlook on life, if you, if you, if you provide them with information that focuses exclusively on the local impacts of climate change, can actually reduce their sense that, that they should be worried about the bigger picture. So I think, again, it, the, 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 the um, line to take is, is, is one of striking the right balance. Um, and there are some, there's some good examples. We'd have liked to have shown you a couple of videos today, actually. Unfortunately, the, 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 the WebEx software didn't seem to want to share the audio of, of, of the videos. But um, there's, some, there's some good recent examples of um, campaigns which I think have applied this, this kind of balanced approach. Um, the Climate Coalition's uh, campaign, which 
is, 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 is strapline is for the love of climate change. It focuses on the things that people love um, that they might want to protect from climate change. And that means starting from, from the things that people are interested in, connecting with people um, at a level that, that makes sense with them, resonates with them, but then building up and widening out from there to make parallels perhaps to other communities that have been affected in a similar way. Um, and, and, and in that way, it's, it's, it's using, I guess it's using local things such as flood impacts um, as a starting point for wider engagement on climate change rather than an, an end in itself. And moving on to our, our final point in the report, um, and then as, as I said, please, please do send through questions if you have any in your mind. It would be great to be able to collect some of those. Um, and, and, and we'll, we'll pick up as many of them as we can. Um, and we'll, if, if we do get them before, then we'll be able to answer them in a, in a relatively seamless way. Otherwise, we'll need to wait for them to come in. Um, but the final, the final point in the report, the final principle, and I think it is appropriate that it's, it's the final one, um, strikes not, not a pessimistic note, but I think, I think uh, a, a realistic one um, in the sense that the climate is changing and the our flood risks in the UK and elsewhere are, are changing too. So getting back to normal, it may not be straightforward. And that, I think, can, can have a, a, a kind of everyday meaning. It might be something like, well, now that we know our house is, is at an elevated level of threat, we need to accept that we have to move some plugs further up the wall or some kind of everyday action that someone could take to protect themselves a bit more easily against flooding. But I think it's also a bit more of a general philosophical point, perhaps, that um, climate change means negotiating a new understanding of what's normal across multiple aspects of our lives. You know, the food that we eat, our agriculture, the way we travel, the way we heat our homes, the way we govern ourselves and our, and our risks in the future. And so that idea of getting back to normal, um, you know, it, it, it probably isn't the most appropriate way to think about it. And perhaps it's an unrealistic expectation to to be communicating to people. What's more realistic and arguably more useful is, is an idea of building um, resilience and preparedness. Um, and, and there's been some interesting work in the States actually um, by an organization called Climate Access, which looked at this, this, this idea of being prepared for the future preparedness in quite a lot of detail. And, and their, their conclusion was it was, it was a good, that, that, that concept, that way of framing um, future risks was, was, a, was a good, way of engaging people from across the political spectrum. So you know, being prepared, being responsible um, for, for, for future risks that, that, that are changing and, and are developing as, as underlying changes in the climate um, progress. And I guess back to almost where we, where we started really, which is that beginning, beginning that conversation um, as soon as possible and in the way that is productive, so understanding who the audience are that you're speaking to, having a dialogue with them rather than sending out messages that, that perhaps don't relate particularly to, to the, the local area or the group of people you're speaking to. That's the, that, that's the, that's the key to, to building a type of engagement around flood risks that, that, um, that, 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 that gives us a, a platform for, for, for um, public engagement on climate change um, more widely. So I hope that that was a useful uh, zip through the nine principles that we had in the flooding report. Um, we've, I think we have a couple of we do, questions we do, we do, yeah. coming in, so we'll be able to immediately answer some of those, and, and I'll, I'll bring Stuart back into the, the visual display as well as we answer yes. these, and I guess we'll we'll to the window. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so we, um, we've we had a couple of questions. Um, we'll probably start with the first one that came in, shall we? Um, so uh, someone has asked, this has been focused so far uh, mostly on the UK. Are you aware of international projects along these lines and would you like to be involved? Um, speaking for myself in, in terms of someone who's mostly interested in, in, in the research side of things, uh, yeah, there has been uh, quite a lot of international work Looking at this 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 research area it does experience of um, extreme weather affect perceptions about climate change. So this has been quite a, a live research issue. Now, in particular, um, from the point of view of um, search findings, I would I guess refer people to the Yale project on climate change communication, 
Um, and they've, they've had a number of papers out looking at how um, experience with, with weather events can affect perceptions. And I guess they're, they're finding kind of similar things to, to us. Now, um, some of these studies will have we'll look at different uh, measures of attitudes as in you know what what does experience affect does it affect whether you believe in climate change quite a lot of studies look at that um, so basic kind of acceptance of the reality others look at people's willingness to to act to take personal action or to support um, policy responses one of the things that we were um, quite interested in with with our current research was which we felt hadn't been addressed uh, in in that international body of research I guess was the extent to which whether experience with flooding might affect people's willingness to undertake adaptation measures, both in the domain of, of, of flood events, so that the things that people had been affected by, but also um, in, in terms of, of other unrelated climate impacts like um, heat waves. And, and we did indeed find, I mean, this is work in progress, we're writing it up at the moment, but it looks like we, we do have some findings there whereby um, the experience of climate change affects people's uh, across a, a range of um, attitudes and willingness to act and support for policy and so on. Um, I would say actually one of the other um, uh, sources in the report, um, I, I couldn't say off the top of my head which uh, which footnote it's in, but there's there's a paper by someone called Suzanne Moser who looks at, who, who integrates some of the international research that has been done um, looking at uh, communicating around climate adaptation based on people's experiences with um, the weather. I, I don't know if Adam wants to say a bit more about that. No, question. well, I mean, I think I think it's a good. It's, it's, it's obviously an important point, and and I guess as Stuart said at the beginning, um, this was this was less of a uh, a sort of a, a start from scratch, comprehensive analysis of everything that, that that's out there in terms of. Um, research or practice on, on on public engagement with with flood risks and and climate change, it was more a synthesis of the points that were made and the and the key references that were suggested to us by a group of people who were who were um, all from the UK context. And I guess I guess in some ways, this is this is unavoidably local um, uh, in, in in its focus because I think that making the link between local um, impacts and, and, and climate change does need that kind of angle but that doesn't mean that at all that it should be blind to to you know similar processes that we we would surely observe in other countries um, around the world i think the context is is very different when you're trying to i think i think in the uk you're we're still at a point where we're just about trying to get ahead of the curve on 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 building public resilience to climate impacts and thinking about public engagement um, I think it's fair to say that you know the worst the worst impacts of, of, of climate change are, are not with us yet in other places around the world we don't face this challenge of trying to overcome psychological distance um, people are, are, are very well aware of, of what's happening to the changes in their climate um, but I think I think it would be great to, to, to try and um, link this resource um, up with with other similar resources that are available internationally and let's look at let's look at the similarities let's look at the commonalities let's see where we can where we can draw out really common points and say these things apply um, across different countries and different cultures it's a good question okay so next question we've got here uh, is uh, what practical effects might an understanding of climate change have on the actions and choices that people make um, I did I think I, I don't want to sort of talk too much about that but, um, I tried to address that a little bit um, in response to the last question it does look like, I mean, when we, when we do the number crunching, when we apply the stats to this, it does look like that overall there is a tendency um, for uh, experience of these extreme weather events to affect uh, people's attitudes and responses across a range of domains. I mean, I, th I would say probably the most striking finding from our research was um, the experience of flooding raised the, the the sense that climate change was a kind of a national priority. It was actually a suggestion from um, George Marshall at uh, climate outreach, he said he looked at our, our survey when we designed it and said, "Well, you've got all these questions about climate change and flooding and so on, but um, you've already, you know, you've already kind of given the game away once you start asking people are they concerned about climate change. What about having a question right at the start of the survey that says, um, what do you think are the most important issues facing the UK?" And, and we did that. And so before people had been asked any questions um, about climate change or flooding, we said, 
what do you think are the three most important issues facing um, the UK today and over the next 20 years? Now, of course, you get a lot of people talking about um, saying things like the economy, you know, jobs, healthcare, immigration, the sorts of things you'd expect, the sorts of things that are important to people. But um, we actually found that for people who've been affected by flooding, climate change spontaneously emerged as being one of these top three national important issues. And I think that's quite significant because um, whilst for those of us sort of working in this field sort of feel quite strongly that climate change is very important, there's often this sense that, well, you know, most people, most people out there don't really care, don't really get it. Um, aren't that bothered about it, it's way down their list. And I think one of the, the, the striking things for me from this research was to show that actually um, the experience of these sorts of weather events does make a difference and does raise climate change quite high up um, people's lists of um, priorities. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything about that. Yeah, well, I, I'm going to... There, there's another question on the, on the list which I might pick up on. Um, have you worked directly with practitioners in this area to help develop their messaging? Uh, I think yes, but we'd like to do that a lot more. Um, I think I think it's really crucial, and this is something that we feel really passionately about at Climate Outreach, and we we we, we try to 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 practice in everything that we do is to is to really um, build and strengthen the links between research and and, and practice. And, you know, on, on, on climate change communication, um, and I think that the you know the group of people that we that we managed to get together that that day um, for the workshop was really strong. I, I, I hope that we'll be able to to continue to to draw on, on on the people who contributed that day as a as a network of researchers and practitioners. Um, at, at Climate Outreach, we've we've run. Uh, much, much, much more closely to the 2013 floods. We ran a series of of community workshops where we where we talked to people about their experience of of, of flooding um, and and whether they uh, linked it to, to climate change and whether they felt able or willing or whether they needed to put more support to to um, talk about that issue in their local area. We're also collaborating at the moment with. Um, Stuart Barr and Ewan Woodley at, at the University of Exeter on, on a project with uh, a, a, a group, group of people in credit. And in fact, there's a meeting happening right now, which I, I would have been attending if I hadn't have been uh, presenting this webinar. Um, and, and the group in credit have been building a, a flood resilience plan for credit um, which, which, which which we're getting to the point where, we, where we're um, heading towards the end of that project and summarizing the learning. Um, and, and I think I think we've been we've been we've been involved in, in in that, and that's been useful and helpful to to feed in some of the some of the points and some of the the, the um, issues that we've that we've covered in this report. So yeah, I think working with practitioners in a variety of ways. But but you know what what would be fantastic would be to to, to be able to have a I guess a bit more of a, a a permanent infrastructure of people who who are who are who are proactively. Doing public engagement, drawn from across civil society and across um, policy and, and, and research fields, because I think it, that that kind of that level of commitment is is very much proportionate with the the level of risk and the level of challenge that we face on this. Okay, so we've got a couple more uh, questions here. We could should we cover this one. Um, so um, we have a, another question that says, uh, in floods, people often show strongly caring, communitarian and altruistic behavior. Is there a danger that this could decline with repeated impacts and become more self-interested? And if so, how could altruistic responses be validated and reinforced? Um, that's a very good question. I, I'm mm. not sure I have a, a succinct answer to that. I, I think, um, yeah, that, that's very true. And one, one of the things um, that we kind of wrestle with in terms of um, psychological responses to climate change, if you like, is that um, one, one of the reasons that uh, those people who are, are concerned about climate change and do act on it and, and, and do, you know, go out of their way to, to, to try and mitigate or reduce their emissions and, and so on and so forth, tend to do those things for altruistic reasons or because they, you know, maybe care about people in far away other places uh, and so on. Um, and so that's in the kind of mitigation domain, trying to reduce emissions, this tends to be quite uh, focused on concerns about others. Whereas when you, th there is this risk, I think, and, it, and it's brought out in a couple of the, the principles in, in this report, there is this risk of that if you start talking about adaptation and localized responses, that if you can, um, if you can somehow literally 
pull up the, the drawbridge and put up the, the floodgates, then, well, okay, uh, you said climate change is, is about me. Um, I believe you, and I've managed to, to stop the water coming in my house. Okay, climate change, that's dealt with now. Um, and there is a risk, I think, inherent in some of this that we could inadvertently turn um, turn this kind of altruistic oriented mm. behavior into something that is potentially quite self-interested. So, yeah, I don't know if I have a succinct response, but just I'll, I'll hand it over to Adam. Maybe he has. <laughs> um, well, I think I think it's a really key issue, actually. Um, and, and I think that, that as, I, as I said a, a little earlier, research is, is, is starting to, to come in on this now and to maybe just, just point to ways of, of perhaps striking that balance um, of, 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 on the one hand, showing that, that climate change is relevant to, to people's lives and saying this is not just something that happens to other people who are, who are far away, but without um, undermining that, that concern for the, 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 the bigger issue, which is obviously the main motivation. It isn't just about um, floods in, in, in one particular village or town. Um, in the UK, and I mean, I think there's th th there's various things that have been suggested. One is, I guess, you know, it's drawing parallels between one local area um, and another local area or other local areas. Everyone lives in a local area, so it's about you know finding that common ground and starting from where people are, but not stopping at where people are. You know, it's the start of a conversation, not the end of one. Um, and, and another another I think quite interesting approach is there was um, some, some 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 recent research which. Which, which, which looked at people's sense of what's called place attachment, um, and 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 that can can mean being, you know, uh, emotionally attached to to your local area or your local um, village or house or pub or um, football fields or whatever it might be that you're 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 motivated by and interested in, but people also have can have a sense of place attachment that transcends geographical. Um, Closeness. So I think I think it doesn't have. I think it. I think it's. I think it's absolutely key. Um, there is a real risk of 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 going from one extreme to the other, um, and to and to be and suggesting to people that that climate change is, is only about things that are relevant to them. But I think it is possible with 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 the right kind of um, narratives and and stories about climate change that that start from what from you know where where people are and the things that they care about but build outwards from there using those those values and those interests as a starting point um but end up somewhere which is more more global um in in in, in perspective okay um we have another question uh, do you think public policy infrastructure i.e the government defra uh, is geared to take up the findings of, of this research or are they still projecting a message of we'll get back to you uh, we'll get you back to pre-flooding normal lifestyles, etc. Um, it occurs to me, well, there's a couple of things that occur to me there. There's, um, and when we talk in the report about um, uh, avoiding the, the idea of, of getting back to, completely getting back to normal, I, I'd make a distinction, I suppose, uh, as to getting back to normal on the one hand could mean getting back so you don't have um, your living room full of water, you don't have sewage in your, you know, the downstairs of your house. So in that sense, people wanting mm. to get back to normal, being able to live their lives and not be, you know, kind of overwhelmed with this with this horrible issue, um, is, is, you know, seems perfectly reasonable. What what um, you would want to be uh, bringing about, um, but what what is perhaps inappropriate is to talk about getting back to normal, as in there's no climate change because that's not going to go away. So we're never going to get back to um, a quote normal situation uh, where we have no climate change. Um, now I. Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know if I want to comment in detail on public policy infrastructure. You, you might um, perhaps wonder whether having one government department that's focused on adaptation and another that's focused on uh, mitigation isn't entirely joined up. So, but that's a, obviously a fairly um, macro issue. Um, but yeah, perhaps that's one way in which they're not uh, geared up. So. Yeah, there's, I'll, I'll, I'll take another, another question that's come through. Um, it's uh, some, someone, someone says, I, I found in interviewing around 35 previously flooded businesses that the notion of climate change hardly came up, only with a couple of people who were very well informed on hydrological issues. I was surprised how little it was mentioned. Uh, me too. I'm constantly surprised how little it is mentioned in, in, in all sorts of, of ways. Um, I mean, this is, this is an issue that, that, that we've spent quite a lot of, 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 of time and energy focusing on that climate outreach, the, the idea that there is, in many different ways, 
um, a, a sort of social silence around climate change. As Stuart said, you know, most people most people know what it is. If 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 prompted, will say they're concerned about it. Um, may even may even mention it spontaneously um, if if they're provoked in some way through perhaps an event like a like a major flood. But for the most part, most of the time, given how serious the the the, the, the risks are and given how many times we can be told this is the defining issue of the 21st century, I think it's fair to say that there is a bit of a disjunction between how much people talk about it and, and the scale of the problem. Um, and I think this, nowhere is safe from this. I think this, this, is, this is true of, of, of uh, you know, everyday social interaction. I'm, I'm sure most of us can reflect on that from our own experiences. But it's also true institutionally, I think. Um, and that you, 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 you I, I would, I would share your, your, your sense that you can often be in a group of people who, on the face of it, um, study extremely climate-related things for a living, or, or, or work on extremely climate-related issues, um, but yet don't necessarily talk about the underlying problem too much. Why is that? Is it because it's too overwhelming, too scary, too threatening? Um, do people just know it's there but but don't acknowledge it? I don't think we have the answer to that. There's a range of different suggestions for why it is. But one thing I would say is I think that in a in any kind of in a vacuum around around positive uh, proactive engagement on climate change, more skeptical views are likely to grow. Or, or at a minimum, we have no idea what other people think about climate change or about climate policy. So there's been a a, a series of of survey findings that have been fascinating I think they they show that people people tend to overestimate the the um, the prevalence of, of skeptical views about climate change but also massively underestimate the level of support there is for um, renewable energy technology so most people support renewable energy technologies at least at a national level um, but when you ask people do you think other people you know support renewable technologies they they say no or they say oh i think only only a minority do and that, to me that's a pretty clear sign that because there isn't that baseline level of engagement around climate change it 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 it, le it leaves a gap and and in that gap either nothing very much is said or we completely misunderstand what other people think about the issue because we don't know what other people think about the issue because no one ever talks about it um and and i think that's a major kind of general barrier to to, to overcome that goes a bit beyond um, flood risks, but is 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 certainly relevant for for the relationship between climate change and and climate impacts in the in the UK. Yeah, I think one of the things that um, just following up on that very briefly, one of the things that came out quite strongly uh, in in the workshop back in, in June is that um, for, for those people who were affected by flooding and who were uh, working with communities who were aff affected by flooding, then the, the emphasis is often very much on the very practical, very real, very very local um, issues, and that in that sense, climate change is something a bit more uh, nebulous, shall we say? And so, uh, there, was, there was some research back in, so probably some of the earliest research on this topic back in uh, the early 2000s by Lorraine Whitmarsh found something uh, similar to this um, point made that uh, when you when you actually talk to people who have been flooding flooded, uh, then climate change doesn't necessarily come up spontaneously. They might talk about uh, blocked drains or or dredging uh, and so on and so forth. Um, now, does that mean that under the surface somewhere um, there, there is aware an awareness of this? I think the, the work that Climate Outreach has done that um, Adam has touched on is, is very relevant here, that there is this sense that climate change is something that is just not something we really talk about. It's, it's not necessarily something you bring in to the conversation. And so I guess part of the part of the motivation for this report and and for some of the other work that adam's done is to try and kind of break that silence to uh to start having conversations about uh climate change. now if you if you do bring the topic of climate change up you, some people may be skeptical some people may may um may turn out that they they're, they're very concerned about this but um yeah it's interesting that you you say that this this hardly came up um and that would seem to be in line with some of the previous research mm -hmm. and some of the concerns we have about why we want to do this um, work. Okay, we have this. Yeah, uh, we've probably we've probably got time for one more question, or maybe 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 two, if any more coming through. Um, but this next one says, in the Oxford workshop, did you discuss insurance insurance at all? Um, is insurance missing from the conversation, and what more can insurance companies do in terms of communications? My sense uh, is that insurance companies have 
were pretty quick off the mark amongst their uh, amongst uh, potentially other businesses or other private sector organisations to acknowledge um, climate change, and for, I guess for fairly obvious reasons. Um, and I and I do think that it, it did come up at the Oxford workshop several times, um, and 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 I think it's it's a good example of of a quite a practical everyday solid tangible concept that most people have some sense of of engaging with already um that that could could potentially provide you know a a very different hook for a for a campaign that was aimed at building engagement with flood risks climate impacts even more widely climate change but that perhaps started with a question on a public notice board in a in a village hall that that, that said something about you know is 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 your uh, are your are your is your house insurance changing or have you heard about people who who aren't able to be insured in particular areas it's it's just a it's a different way to start a conversation it's a different kind of hook that that people might might more instinctively um, engage with and then I guess this it, I think it is an interesting example because if you if you then pursued that in you know, perhaps the wrong direction, you might say, well, all we've done is, is built up people's kind of frustration about how, how much their insurance premiums are going up. We've done nothing to build wider engagement on climate change. But it doesn't have to be limited to that. You can just use that as a starting point for a conversation. You can bring in other issues. And I think there is a, just a lot to be said for not forcing the issue on climate change. It, it isn't something easy for people to, to truly engage with it is is scary and 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 threatens all sorts of things that that many of us hold dear, and so I think allowing climate change to to bubble up in a conversation that didn't start as being about climate change makes makes a lot more sense and 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 fits and a lot more naturally um, with people than 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 perhaps going into a community who is at risk of, of flooding or has just experienced a flood, and 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 presenting them with a fully formed climate change campaign. You know, there's. It comes with a lot of baggage already, climate change, I think. So the more that people can engage with it on their own terms, the, the, the more likely that conversation is to be productive, I think. Yeah, just to add uh, quickly to that, um, in terms of the, the, the question itself, did, did insurance come up at the Oxford workshop? I, I, I don't recall um, specifically, but I would say that um, it has been argued that the, the, the consequences of climate change for insurance has been drawn attention to as a, a very real consequence for people in their, you know, in their in their everyday lives. You, you might have all manner of opinions about climate change. You might be completely sceptical about it, but you can't be sceptical about your insurance premium. It's there. It's real. Um, even if you don't believe in it, then the insurance companies do. So, in a sense, that the, the, the insurance is quite a good example of. Um, uh, avoiding talking about, shall we say, that all the uncertainties and the, the lack of clarity mm. around climate change and do we know, don't we know, to actually frame this as um, an issue of, of risk. And, and that's what insurance companies um, inherently do. They're concerned with risk, quantifying risk. Um, and if they think that the risk of um, uh, flooding has, has increased due to climate change or, or, or other uh, extreme weather events, then, then they will increase premiums, you might argue. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure that's a a helpful positive message for communication, but it certainly does make um, a concrete everyday reality out of um, a rather more usually nebulous issue. And I think that we are out of time, um, and I think that was the, the final question to come through anyway, so it's probably a good point to leave it. Just to say, um, once again, you know, please, please do have a look at the report. If you haven't had a look already, you can download it from the Climate Outreach website. You can find out more about our our work at climate outreach on on flooding and climate change at the climate outreach website the understanding risk um, research group there's a web address for that on our final slide as well there you can find out more about the the, the work that the understanding risk group does on public perceptions of climate change and all sorts of other things um, more generally thank you to to everyone that was involved in the report um, to, to Lydia Messling especially um, for all the work that, 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 that she did um, and to uh, the support from from Cardiff University and from the ESRC as well um, and we'll, we'll sign off and, and, yeah. and leave it there thank you very much and um, do get in touch if you uh, want to talk further about any of the research or issues we've talked about thanks <laughs>